This video is made possible by Blinkist. There are so many great books out there that we all want to read, but so often, fitting in reading, carrying a book, or reading on a screen is a hassle. Blinkist solves that problem by condensing the key points of more than 4,500 non-fiction titles. You can choose to either listen to them or read to the summarized points, or both. That means that I could be finding out everything about the intelligent investor without having to read this massive book while I'm going for a run or even cooking dinner. The app lets you save your playlist and will offer suggestions based on the titles you enjoy, whether that's history, psychology, or tools for entrepreneurs. They also have a selection of abridged podcasts, delivering the key points in 15 minutes or less. But the best thing is that you can access the library offline, making Blinkist the perfect beach read. If this sounds like something you'd be into, the first 100 people to go to Blinkist.com forward slash visual politic are going to get unlimited access for one week to try it out. You'll also get 25% off if you decide you want to continue with the full membership. Don't forget that Blinkist seven day trial is completely free and that you can cancel at any time during the trial if you're not completely into it, but I'm sure you will be. So click on the link in the description and check it out today. And now for today's video. Let's be honest, one year after the outbreak of COVID-19, we have all become, even if only a little bit, pandemic experts. Let's see, who dares to tell me that they've never had a discussion about this or that vaccine, about PCRs, antigen tests, or the origin of the virus? Probably none of you. But while it may seem that we already know the name and surname of all the vaccines there are, I'm sure that in this video, you'll discover something new. Tell me, have you ever heard of the Uzbek Chinese vaccine? I bet you haven't. We're talking about a vaccine that has been registered in Uzbekistan under the name ZFUZ. VAC 2001, as a reminder. But don't worry, because today we're not going to get into biochemistry. What interests me is to take a closer look at this odd relationship, China and Uzbekistan. Why did they decide to produce this vaccine together? What exactly is it that unites these two countries? In this video, we've got a lot to talk about, and we won't only be talking about Uzbekistan. We're heading to a part of the world where everyone decided to give their countries the same suffix. We're talking about Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, and Turkmenistan. Or in other words, Central Asia. This region has been in the sights of the great powers since the 19th century, and today, the situation has not changed much. These days, the competition for influence is now between Russia, the United States, Turkey, India, Pakistan, and of course, China. Beijing has been investing in the Stans for years. It builds infrastructure, sends its workforce, and controls a very high percentage of the foreign debt of these countries. And that is precisely what we are going to look at. What is China doing in Central Asia? Who stands to gain? And is this region of the world becoming the new field of expansion of the re-emerging Chinese empire? Well, let's get started. As you may have already suspected, in this video, we're going to talk a lot about money. This is one of the most unequal divisions in the world. For example, none of you will be surprised that if I tell you that China's GDP is 50 times that of all the Central Asian countries combined. Comparing China with, for example, Tajikistan is like talking about David and Goliath. Of course, in this case, David and Goliath are not fighting, but trading. This is not so unusual. After all, we're talking about neighboring countries, and it would be strange if they did not have any kind of commercial relationship. But the truth is that China is also one of Central Asia's main investors and creditors. And of all of them, it is the energy sector that interests it most. Chinese firm to build Kazakh hydropower plant, JOC. Exim Bank of China allocates loan to Uzbek Bank to modernize HPP, Energy Central. And that's not all. We will look at it later, but I can already tell you that several routes of the new Silk Road pass precisely through Central Asia. Beijing is also building and financing the transportation infrastructure, such as roads and railroads, that it needs to ensure the transit of its products. Remember, however, that we are talking about countries with little or no democracy, in which corruption simply reigns with absolute power. So many times, the money disappears into the official statistics themselves. That's why foreign investments are a risky bet, and even China has been burned already, more than once. So lately, it's engaged in smaller projects, some factories and cement plants, or mines yielding gold, copper, zinc, and other natural resources. 
on the other hand, Beijing is also financing the construction of schools and colleges where Chinese is studied in these countries. It is opening Confucius Institutes throughout the region and even has several scholarship programs in place so that Central Asian students can do academic exchanges in China. This is an example of the expansion of soft power, the new reality of Chinese influence that we, in the West, are still unaware of but is gaining more and more influence. In total, over the past 15 years, China has allocated $54 billion to investment and construction in Central Asia. That is about the same as the entire GDP of Uzbekistan. But you may be thinking by now that Central Asia's relationship with China is only about money. Well, the truth is that they have something else in common, their passion for technology and control. Tell me, what name would you give to a project that consists of constant surveillance and facial recognition? Well, in the finest Orwellian style, it is called Safe Cities. And I don't know if you like the idea, but I can tell you who loves it. Tajikistan and Uzbekistan are already developing their Safe Cities programs with Huawei. Obviously, the concept of security involves ensuring the security of the bigwigs in power. And continuing with Tajikistan, we can't ignore one more aspect in its relations with China. We're talking about the military presence. In Central Asia's Forbidding Highlands, a quiet newcomer, Chinese troops, WP. You probably already know that China has military bases in Djibouti and in the South China Sea, but the one in Tajikistan is its first appearance in Central Asia, and it has to do with the security on the Afghan border. Look at this map. You are looking at the triple border between China, Tajikistan, and Afghanistan in the Wakhan Corridor. The first Chinese military base in Central Asia is located in the Tajik territory very close to this point. It may not seem so important to you, but for China, it is a milestone and a major step forward. Until now, its relations with the region were limited to the economic side, but China's influence is growing, and now it's gunning to take on a new role. In recent months, Beijing has not missed the opportunity to strengthen its influence in Central Asia with a new type of diplomacy, that involving vaccines. If you recall, we started this video talking about the Uzbek Chinese vaccine developed by the Chinese biopharmaceutical company Anhui Zifai Longcom, sorry if I mispronounced that completely wrong, and the Chinese Academy of Sciences. And you're probably thinking, if both institutions are Chinese, what does Uzbekistan have to do with it? Well, this is where the interesting part begins. Uzbekistan was one of the countries that participated in the trials of this vaccine, as did for example Ecuador and Pakistan. But in February 21, this happened. The Chinese company recognized Uzbekistan as a co-author of the development of the ZF2001 vaccine, UZ Daily. Uzbekistan officially became the co-author of the vaccine thanks to, and I quote, its contribution and effort. We don't know whether Pakistan and Ecuador didn't make enough effort, but it took less than two weeks for the following news to come to light. Uzbekistan approves Chinese-developed COVID-19 vaccine, Reuters. It was the first Central Asian country to do so, thus opening the region's doors to Chinese vaccines. Soon after, Kyrgyzstan and Turkmenistan approved Sinopharm and Tajikistan is waiting to receive its Sinovac. In Central Asia, everything is increasingly revolving around China. So why is China so interested in Central Asia? And vice versa, what did the Stan stand to gain from the Asian giant? Listen up. The Fine Print If you're a regular follower of visual politic, you need not be reminded that Chinese foreign policy today is nothing like what it was 50 years ago. That's the thing about being a country with a much larger and more prosperous economy. Well, as far as Central Asia is concerned, China started to gain prominence in the 1990s. Remember that, until 1991, the Stans were part of the Soviet Union, and at the latter stage, Sino-Soviet relations left much to be desired. So from that point on, Beijing has had to solve the most trivial problems with its new neighbours, how to define the borders, or what to do about the civil war in Tajikistan. But the main change came in the 2000s, when China began to invest the enormous amounts of dollars it was accumulating, thanks to its huge trade surplus around the world. But why exactly Central Asia? Well, basically for three reasons. Take a look. On the one hand, China shares more than 3,000 kilometers of border with Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, and Tajikistan, and also has much in common with the countries in the region. For example, in the early 1990s, one out of every 1,000 people in China was Kazakh, Tajik, Uzbek, or Kyrgyz. On the other hand, since 1993, China has consumed more energy than it produces. In other words, it needs to import it. So the Stans have become a crucial source of oil and gas for Beijing. And thirdly, in 2013, China announced the creation of the new Silk Road. Therefore, Central Asia became a key territorial route to connect Chinese products with European markets. But since I think this is more or less clear, let's move on to the next question. What does Central Asia gain from its relationship with China? Mm -hmm. 
Well, you see, here it should be taken into account that after the collapse of the USSR, the Stans became the poorest countries in the entire post-Soviet space. For decades, they had highly interconnected production systems and were basically monoculture economies. That is, they were highly specialized in a few products that they produced on a large scale to supply the rest of the republics. But then all of that collapsed. Then again, if only all of Central Asia's problems were economic. But that's not the case. Because except for Kyrgyzstan, on the political level, they are all examples of non-democratization. We're talking about regimes that work in a leader-centric way and have no concern for human rights. Add to that the endemic corruption, and you have a pretty good picture of a region in which few would want to invest. That is why China's cash injection was like manna from the heaven for Central Asia. Moreover, Beijing's money is not conditional on political reforms or anything like that. And furthermore, by developing new roads and gas pipelines to the east thanks to Chinese money, the Stans are reducing their historical dependence on Russia. So far, it might seem like a perfect relationship. But remember to always read the fine print. In its relations with Central Asia, China dictates the terms. As a result, many contracts involve the use of Chinese machinery, the employment of Chinese labor, and the resolution of potential disputes in Chinese courts. And of course, we're talking about China, which is not exactly a country that plays at being the most popular, starting with working conditions that are often downright poor. So don't think it's all plain sailing. In the last two years, the region has seen more than 40 demonstrations against Chinese expansion. And sometimes they've had direct consequences. China led $280 million Kyrgyzstan project to abandoned after protests. Reuters. In any case, generally speaking, anti-Chinese sentiment has grown more in Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan, countries where roughly one third of the population has a negative opinion of the Asian giant. In contrast, China is much better viewed in the two countries with which it does not border, Uzbekistan and Turkmenistan. Of course, in this region of the world, public opinion is far from representing official positions. And if China has won anything, it is the hearts of the elites. You come to understand that lack of transparency is a great ally for corruption. Often, there is no way of knowing how much money evaporates along the way without a trace. In other words, China's huge line of credit is very good for the political bigwigs in Central Asia to collect their cut. And that is one of the reasons why these projects often fail to perform as expected. And then of course, there's what happens when it's time to pay back the loans. China does not forgive debts. In economics, external debt amounts to all the obligations that a state has with other countries or with foreign institutions. For example, the credit offered by the Exim Bank of China, the Export-Import Bank of China, translates into foreign debt for the countries receiving these credits. As you can imagine, there is no Central Asian country exempt from debt to China. Beijing controls 42% of the Kyrgyz foreign debt, 40% of the Tajik one, 20% of the Uzbek one, and 10% of the Kazakh one. As far as Turkmenistan goes, we cannot give you any data because public statistics are not exactly the forte of its regime. What is clear is that the most indebted countries are also the two poorest in the region, Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan. And you may ask, why is China lending so much money to countries that may not be able to pay it back? Well, in the world of international relations, there are theories for everything. For example, four years ago, the academic Brahma Chalani presented his own, which is called Debt Trap Diplomacy. In a nutshell, it says that China does not expect to recoup the loans it offers to underdeveloped countries. Instead, it intends to create a bond of political dependence and even challenge the sovereignty of these states. Of course, this is only one theory. Obviously, China is neither the devil, nor is Central Asia or any other country in the world obliged to accept its funding. To simply apply the theory of debt trap diplomacy would imply exempting local elites from any responsibility. Perhaps the problem is the perverse incentive that corruption generates. Something like, I'll take my cut now and we'll see how the state pays for its share later. The fact is that each country is looking for ways to cope with the ever increasing Chinese debt. For example, Turkmenistan is selling gas below market price. Kazakhstan, which borders China China's Xinjiang region is keeping a low profile in the face of the persecution of the Uyghurs. But perhaps the most interesting cases are those of Tajikistan and Kyrgyzstan. For these two countries, one of the most common ways of repaying the debt to China is by ceding the rights to exploit natural resources. And that is why we can find news stories like this. Tajikistan ratifies transfer of gold mines to Chinese for Ghana. As of today, up to 80% of Tajikistan's gold mines are under the control of Chinese companies. But not only that, because there are rumors that Tajikistan's reluctance to join the Eurasian Economic Union, which we've already covered in a separate video that I'll link in the description, is precisely due to Beijing's interests. And the icing on the cake. In 2011, the Tajik parliament ratified a new protocol on border delimitation, whereby China received more than 1,000 square kilometers in the Pamir mountain range. That is almost 
1% of the entire territory of Tajikistan. China does not forgive its debts. Kyrgyzstan's situation is even worse. Like the other Central Asian countries, its economy is heavily dependent on remittances, which account for more than 30% of GDP. That is why the coronavirus pandemic was such a blow to the country. And now it's even more difficult for it to pay off its debt to China, which also contributes around 30% of its GDP. So do you think you can guess what the official proposal was to deal with this debt? Ready? Here it is. Account for transfer of funds to repay external debt opened in Kyrgyzstan, 24.kg. You heard that correctly. Kyrgyz Ministry of Finance has opened up a bank account for anybody to contribute to paying the country's foreign debt. And the most significant point is that this is not the first time it's happened either. In 2007, the then president Atambayev also opened a similar bank account. At that time, the external debt was lots of ones, nines, and zeros. Basically, almost two billion dollars. Now, how much money do you think he received? Well, evidently not much. No more than $3,350. In 2020, they did a little bit better, $12,000, which is hardly a drop in the bucket compared to Kyrgyzstan's foreign debt. For the time being, the country has no choice but to continue to deepen its dependence on China. And now, the question is over to you. What do you think about this crowdfunding idea? Do you know about China's role in Central Asia? Is it possible to take advantage of China's credits without becoming dependent? You can leave your answers down in the comments. And you know, if you found this video interesting, don't forget to like and subscribe to Visual Politic. All the best, see you in the next one.